Hello there and welcome to the Q&A show. My name is Cyrus Fernando and as every Monday evening, I'm here live and interactive, here to take your questions. And this program is all about our viewers. So maybe this is the first time you're watching the Q&A show or this is your opportunity to send in your questions about the Bible, about scripture interpretation, about Christianity and also about what is going on in the world today. And to join me tonight to answer your questions is our good friend, Dr. Grady McMurtry. How are you doing, Grady? Doing well, thank you, sir. Always a good to see your smiling face. Oh, bless you. And always good to see you too, Grady. Now, you're normally speaking to us from Florida. Uh, it doesn't look like your normal background. Where are you speaking to us tonight from? <laughs> no, I'm in a hotel room in Richmond, Virginia. Ah, oh, so. what are you doing there? Well, I am speaking on creation science. I'm at a church here and a four day meeting, very common for me to do. And just teaching the truth of creation, both biblically and scientifically. And that is exactly the background that you have, isn't it? You teach creation science um, and you're also a life member of Mensa as well. Um, give our viewers, we obviously have new viewers all the time to Revelation TV, but <laughs> we, we, we always appreciate you joining us and giving that scientific background for us on the Bible interpretation, Grady. Well, you know, the, your greatest witness comes from your greatest change. And I grew up as an evolutionist, born in San Francisco, raised on the campus at the University of California, Berkeley. Believed evolution, earned my science degrees as an evolutionist, taught it from the seventh grade to the university level. But at the age of 27, I did what a good scientist should do. In a search for truth, I became a Christian. And 16 months later, I became a biblical scientific creationist. And I've been teaching on it around the world for the last 49 years. Now, I've got a topic for tonight. Um, to I've got a, a topic for tonight. But before I go into it, it's quite interesting because there was an actor, Will Smith. I'm sure you know him. Um, and there's his yes. wife is Jada Pickett Smith as well. And I listened to an interview that she recently carried out on one of the very big podcasters. And she talked about her life was um, unfulfilled. She had all the money in the world. She had all the success in the world. And yet she didn't have she didn't have a purpose. She didn't feel she had a purpose. So she studied Christianity. She studied the Bible and she studied it from a theological perspective in so many different ways. She studied inside and out many different times for over three or four year period. But sadly, at the end, her conclusion was she didn't build that relationship with Jesus Christ, despite studying the scriptures from back to front as well. What are your thoughts on that or any advice for any of our viewers watching us tonight? And maybe they've been through the Bible, but yet they still don't have that close relationship with Jesus Christ. What would you say to them? Well, first of all, you know, you have to accept the gift of grace in your life so you can study about it all you want. And as an evolutionist at 27, uh, I decided to decide for myself whether Jesus was telling the truth or not. And I spent a six month diligent study reading the Bible for the first time, uh, reading outside histories, and determined at the end of six months that Jesus was telling the truth. And if you're going to seek truth and you find truth, you have to accept it. Now, in the case of Jada Smith, um, it, it's very unfortunate because she, while she had some head knowledge, she never accepted the truth, and therefore the truth could not come into her. You know, John 14 talks about how a Christian, the Holy Spirit comes and dwells within us, that the Holy Spirit will be with us, verse 16, 17, 18, you know, that he will be with us and in us. And so that's the difference between somebody who studies it and is unfulfilled because they don't accept and those of us who do study it and do accept. And I would say to anybody that Christianity is the only rational, reasonable, logical, and evidence-based faith in the world. How important... I came, yeah, sorry. Uh, I was going to say, and I came to faith because of the intellect. Some people become mostly from the emotion. Mm. Uh, but I came primarily from the intellect and became more emotional about it later. And how important is it that someone studying the scriptures are also able to attend a church, have a pastor, have that, have that discipleship as well with other people, with other fellow Christians at the same time, not just reading the scriptures on their own? Well, of course, that's what I did immediately after accepting the Lord. And it was in a room by myself. You might say in a room like this, you know, <laughs> and um, that just made me a saved evolutionist. But there were many questions 
And as a scientist, you know, you expect a checklist at the back of the book, and there isn't one. <laughs> and so I immediately, uh, well, you know, that's just yeah. the way we are. <laughs> and and so I went and made an appointment at a local church to ask an associate pastor who allowed me to come to his office and talk about this. And I asked him, is there anything else I need to do? And in the conversation, he asked if my decision was firm. I looked at him and said, if you knew me, and he didn't know me, he, he, the first time we'd met. Um, but I said, if you knew me, you wouldn't ask the question. And that took him back. But he said, okay, your decision's firm. You need to make it public and showed me scripture. You need to be baptized, showed me scripture. And I was shortly thereafter and, of course, started attending the church immediately. And, and I, th- I think that people forget the scripture says, forsake not the gathering of yourselves together, that those who, for instance, took the, uh, well, convenience of COVID to go home and stay home are actually breaking the scripture of the fact that we should be gathering ourselves together for fellowship to reinforce each other, as well as the, the edification that each one can give and not just from the pastor speaking at the pulpit on a screen, mm. but we need that. We need that fellowship and personal contact, you cannot do that on TV. You know, much as, much as you and I know each other, and we certainly have been together many times, um, this is not the way to have fellowship. Yeah, for sure. Well, there is a topic that I'd like to ask you about tonight, uh, Dr. Grady, and, and this is it. And now here is his topic, and I'd love to get your thoughts on this. The Israel war, is this a sign to end time prophecy? Because prophecy expert Jeff Kinley author of the new book, God's Grand Finale, believes the war in Israel is further evidence we're potentially living in the last days. Speaking at the end time signs more broadly, Kingley said, Bible prophecies clearly predict much about future conflict in Israel. It discusses wars, it discusses wars and rumors of wars that are going to take place, earthquakes that are happening right now. He said, all these things are happening and are uh, pr- uh, precursors, I believe, to the actual end times event that we will be will see in the book of Revelation. Kinley continued, so in my mind is just confirmation that we're living in a very volatile times, but times that are very prophetic as well. With Revelation explicitly mentioning Israel about the key the key of these happenings, many struggled before 1947 to see how it could literally unfold, Kingley said. But once Israel was back after the horrors of the Holocaust, the narrative changed and the clarity came chaos. There's been nothing but conflict since because Satan and those surrounding the nations do not want them to occupy the land of God's promise to Abraham. Satan is very ter- uh, territorial and God promised the land to Abraham. And so I think that this is one of the things that really is a tell tell sign. Now, Grady, we're looking at the war that is going on right now in Israel with the attacks from Hamas and such things. And both both people, innocent lives are being affected from both sides. What do you make out of what is going on and what does the Bible say about it? Well, first of all, from a personal standpoint, I went to my first Seder when I was eight years old, when I was an evolutionist, again at nine, and I've had a close contact with the Jewish community ever since. I even wrote my book on the feasts of the Old Testament because of my relationship with the Jewish community. So I'm a great supporter of Israel and of the people. Uh, I would point out that they need Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior just as much as the unsaved Muslims do. And so, you know, from a biblical standpoint, we are all in need of salvation, regardless of your ethnicity. And you're not going to go to heaven without a relationship with the Father through the Son. That's period. Uh, We do need to be supporting Israel in this fight. There is such a thing as righteous war, or there are other terms for it. As a matter of fact, I'm writing about some of those things right now. Um, But the, the highest apex of of the Bible and of how we are to treat each other as humans is that we are to defend and preserve innocent life. And therefore, when people are attacked for inappropriate reasons, of course, um, we are to, to help and to support them in preserving innocent life. So that's the number one priority. 
Secondly, uh, I have pointed this out before, scientifically, not, not that I'm an end-time expert, but scientifically, having more and more earthquakes, such as we've seen in Afghanistan recently, they've just had their third in a row over six in recent times, um, while it can certainly be tied to end-time prophecy, it is also indicative of the aging of the system that God never intended the earth to last for a long time once it became imperfect. And so the sin of Adam caused the degrading of all systems in the universe. All physical systems, regardless of what they are, are deteriorating over time. And that includes the earth. And so more and more earthquakes, more and more volcanoes is to be expected as the earth ages. So it's a little too easy to take the aging of the earth scientifically and try to tie it to prophecy, while I do agree that it certainly could be. You know, this is a normal thing in nature that's going on, but it is also at the same time indicative of the end time prophecy. So I'm perfectly willing to accept that as well. Now, Grady, you mentioned you visited Israel a number of occasions. Why are the Jewish people so important for Christians? And tell us about your experiences after visiting Israel. Well, I have visited Israel a dozen times, first in 1991. I have helped to lead tours there and co-lead tours there. Um, Israel is the meeting point of three religions, and only one of them can be the correct religion. I think you have to remember that while God gave the land of Israel to the Jews, just verbatim, they also bought it. And there's that old story about, you know, first I, I made you and then I bought you. Uh, and that's what God has done with us. He made us and he also bought us. He created us and then he bought us with the blood of Jesus. And the deeds to Israel are recorded in the Bible where the Jews bought the land, such as Abraham buying the cave at Machpelah, David buying the Temple Mount. And, and the, the deeds are in the Bible itself. Now, the Jews are the only ones there that can preserve the Judeo-Christian heritage with the sites and so forth, because if it were not for them, these sites would not be preserved. If it were not them, many of these sites would not be dug up and be found, etc. And in doing so, they are proving the Bible is absolutely accurate about the historical record that's contained in it. And therefore, it is the land, they are the chosen people by God who were to occupy the land, to keep the land and preserve it. And of course, we as Christians have been grafted into that root. And therefore, it is essential that we keep that root alive, at least as I would put it. Can you give our viewers further insight into Palestine and where the real foundations of that the war between the Palestinians and the Israelis are coming from as well, why they, the Palestinians need to feel that they need to be freed, and also where does Hamas come into this and other organizations? That's a very complex question. First of all, the, the word Palestine didn't start with the Jews, and it didn't start with uh, the Philistines. Uh, actually, that is the word chosen by the Romans, to describe Israel after the conquest by Hadrian. Um, so it's a, it's a word that comes from outside of the culture, but it has been applied for the last roughly 2,000 years because of that. Um, but it is Israel. It is the land that God gave the Jews. Now, in terms of the Gaza Strip, uh, this is the ancestral home of the Philistines. Of, of, for instance, Goliath. Um, and of course, they worshiped the gods, the fish god like Dagon. Um, they were severe pagans uh, that occupied the time of David and after. So that there's been a constant conflict between that kind of paganism and the, the worship of God on the Temple Mount by the Jews and then the Christians as well. So there has been a distinct uh, spiritual warfare. I think that's what people have to forget, uh, that it's not just a, a physical war, that it's a spiritual war that's going on. And one can literally say it's a war between good and evil. Uh, take a look at the difference between uh, the Jews saying, get out because we're coming, versus the surprise attack. And it, it reminds me of when 
you know, they enter into the land under Joshua. Uh, there have been people who have said that that invasion was genocide, but it was not. God told Joshua, send a warning to the people to vacate because this is your land. It's the one I gave you. It's the one that I promised to Abraham. And so they told the people to get out. And only those who stayed were then in danger. Uh, there's also some trickery that went on later. But but the idea that God is not trying to kill these people out of just, you know, some personal vendetta. He simply tells them to, to move voluntarily to get out of the land, and they'll have an opportunity to be saved if they wish to be. But it was a cleansing of the land to, because otherwise there's a cancer in the land. That, that anti-God, and, and we can't even use the term anti-Christ if you allow me to put that in lowercase letters, um, that this is an, against Christ. And so by telling these people to move out of the way, we don't want to hurt you. We just have to protect the innocent life. That, that That's how you need to look at it. It's not genocide at all. What about in Europe, the way that the attacks are now starting to spread through Europe, and we've seen an underlying problem here in the United Kingdom with anti-Semitism. And we've seen many protests taking place, even Jewish people are being attacked. They've even had to close the schools down in, uh, in the United Kingdom, the Jewish schools and such things. In America as well, recently, a little boy of eight years old was just murdered. Um, very sad. I mean, how much is this affecting the conflict that happens in Israel? How much does it affect what goes on in the US, in our own country, the United Kingdom, and the rest of Europe? What do you think? Well, let me put it in a general sense. The, the problem with Christianity is that we sow the seeds of our own destruction. By that, I mean that we are a very tolerant, loving people. We serve a God of love. Uh, we want to love people. We want to love them so that they'll go to heaven with us. But there are those that reject the message. If you'll take a look at Europe 500 years ago, uh, we referred to it at one time as, as the, the Christian, uh, so to speak, the castle, uh, practically a Christian kingdom throughout Europe 500 years ago. And Europe was staunchly Christian. And for the fact of three major battles that occurred, the one in Spain, of course, uh, Granada. Uh, then we have the sea battle at Lepanto. And we have the land battle in the east in Kosovo. And except for these battles where Christians stood strong and prevented the invasion of Christian Europe, um, you would not have had the Christian Europe you've had for almost 500 years. But the problem is that as Europe, and I'm talking about various cultures and countries, um, started becoming atheist. Uh, the French in the 1700s, in England in the 1800s. And as that atheism spread, people forgot that there was a spiritual warfare situation, it opened the borders for people who are strongly religious, whether they're right or not, but strongly religious, uh, to simply come in to emigrate in. And what we've seen then is an invasion without a war. Uh, the same thing is happening here in the United States. And I, I most lament it, I assure you, but the current administration is doing the same thing. They're just inviting millions and millions of people who have no intention of supporting the American concepts of life, our founding documents, our founding principles, or even our Christianity. Um, and they are destroying us by simply being allowed to come in. But this is exactly what's going on in Europe in the 1800s, 1700s. Uh, and we sow the seeds of our own destruction because we are a tolerant people and we don't force you to become a Christian. We will allow you to come and live as long as it's peacefully. Um, but what happens then is that these, these malignant, uh, well, concepts, come in as a cancer in the land, and then they grow. And eventually, they will kill the patient. 
Okay, we're going to go back into viewer emails. So if you would like to set, interact with us tonight, sending your questions, emails are live at revelationtv.com. SMS details are on screen. We're going to go into Lizzie now. Lizzie's asking, <clears throat> why does God allow innocent people to be killed and die every day, including children and newborn babies, such as the atrocities happening in Gaza and Israel at the moment? Again, this is not something that God specifically wants. It is a consequence of human sin in the garden. Now, God doesn't just allow it or promote it. Those are the wrong words. But we have to make a choice. You see, we, we are told that you can choose your life, and you can choose to go to heaven or hell. You can choose to accept the gift of grace in your life or not. Now, why do bad things happen to good people? Because without resistance, we grow weak. But if you have something to resist against, you will be strong. And God wants us to be strong. And so in adversity, we gain strength. Even, even in the death of a believer, even in the death of a young person that you say, oh, they would have had a long life. Even in those situations, the way that we look at it, we have to take the eternal look at it not the short-term look at it. And it has to make us strong to resist the evil that's going on. Okay, there's Alvin written in from South Wales. Thank you, Alvin, for writing and joining in the program. Hi to you both. Great show again tonight. All that's going on in Israel, we must keep praying for the peace of God's people. God is in control. He is in the beginning and the end. Even so, come, Lord Jesus, come. That's from Alvin in South Wales. Thank you, Alvin, for that. Uh, this next one here is... Very, this one's from Dino, Dino in York. Uh, hi, Cy and Dr. Grady, very sad times and more to see the destruction of come, uh, coming to Israel by terrorist Hamas. I agree with, it, with Israel needing to destroy Hamas and attack Gaza, but also when we see images of the people in Gaza being injured, killed, how do we reconcile that from a Christian perspective? Some of the images are very hard to see. Some are fake news, but not all. I'm 100% I'm behind Israel and their right to defend and destroy their enemies. But the innocents caught in the middle, how do we as Christians deal with that? Thank you and blessings to you both, Dino in York. I have to admit, Dino, I'm, I'm absolutely with you. I, I see the footage of what is going on on both sides. And regardless of what we think about terrorism and such things, there are innocent lives, Grady, that are being touched and affected innocent um, women, innocent men, innocent babies, innocent children, their lives are either being killed or they're being affected in so many different ways. What do you think? Well, I would point out that, well, I understand the word innocent and talking about women and children and so forth. Yes. The fact of the matter is that they have an elected leadership that is using them. You know, the, the Jews are not killing the innocents. The innocents are following orders from their elected officials in Hamas, uh, even though they have been told to leave. So their death is the result of their own leadership, of the sinful nature of their own leadership, who are using them as human shields, or demanding that they, they die to support their movement led by Hamas. So, yes, innocent in the sense of innocent life, but not innocent in the sense of why are they dying? This next one here is from uh, Bridget. Bridget's written in to say, good evening, Cy and Grady. My question is this, is Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu a Bible-believing Christian? What do you think? <laughs> well, it's not for me to judge his heart. I would say that, in general, he's been a very good, strong leader, and I'm particularly enamored with his older brother. Uh, but I think Benjamin Netanyahu has been the right man in the right place for the majority of the time he's been prime minister. This one is from Satinda. Thank you, Satinda, for writing in. Uh, God is great is the subject of his uh, email. It says, greetings to you both. One phrase we're hearing repeatedly since the attacks on Israel is Allah Akbar. Uh, most people translate this as God is great. However, I've heard other commentary which state it actually means Allah is greater. The latter would make sense suggesting that Allah is greater than our God, the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, 
What does Grady's thoughts on this please? That's from Satinda. Satinda, I think you're quite right. I think it does really mean God is greater in the sense of, of the Muslim concept. Uh, they're trying to say that the other, other religions, Christianity, Judaism, are inferior. Uh, but I would point out to you that in Islam, you have a, a monotheistic God, such as we have in Judeo-Christian uh, religions. Uh, but he is uh, one personality only, whereas we have one God and three personalities. The, the great Deuteronomy section of the great Shema in Deuteronomy 6, the hero Israel, the Lord our God, is one God. But he also is revealed to us as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And this is how he can relate to us because he understands family relationship. Um, when you have a God who is only one, uh, not three personalities, but one personality, he doesn't know how to relate to a creation. Uh, but what they are trying to say is that their religion is superior. Okay, this next one here is, uh, there's no name on this one, but it's an SMS. It says, Buddhists know from their own experience that Buddhism is the true faith. The reason why I became Buddhist is the happiness and joy committed to Buddhists radiate and the loving kindness they show. I also received Buddha's teaching and his extraordinary blessings and that the honesty helped us so much. Buddha has four qualities that, is, that could not be found in non-Buddhas. Number one, he or she is free from all faults, no killing and no animals or sacrifices. Number two, he is free from fear, jealousy, deity, will fear, loss or somebody else's gain. Number three, the compassion of all beings from the God's realm into the hell realm. And number four, he has complete equality with, he loves Buddhists and non-Buddhists equally, Jews and Palestinians equally, human and animals equally. How wonderful it would be if evangelicals had equal compassion for innocent Jews and innocent Palestinians at this time. So that is from a Buddhist viewer who's watching. What are your thoughts on that one, Grady? I appreciate what he wrote, but it's a misconception of Buddhism. Uh, Buddhism can, in fact, be quite violent. Uh, if you'll take a look at the history of Buddhism, um, particularly, for instance, in Japan, where I have been, uh, Buddhists can be very violent. They can be uh, very anti-Semitic, very anti-Christian. Um, they can, uh, in fact, be quite murderous. Now, the, the basics of Buddhism sound good, but they actually originate in evolution. When you think that plants, animals, and people are equal, that's an evolutionary concept. When you say that, uh, if you're a Buddhist, uh, that you now are released from sin, uh, you're saying somehow or another that your salvation is based on your works, not on uh, a godlike salvation for you. Um, so I would deny that that description is accurate. It shows one aspect of Buddhism if you look at it from one direction, but it is not a circumspect view of Buddhism at all. This one's from... Uh... Pauline saying, can you please help me find the scripture that tells me about people coming up from underground? I read it a long time ago, but didn't understand about terrorists or tunnels. And then I'd like to, I'd like the red uh, around. I'd like to read that again. So that's from uh, scripture on telling people coming up from underground. I think that also relates to things that I've been talking about in the news about the uh, Hamas terrorists. They have the underground tunnels and such things. Where does that refer to in the scriptures, Grady? I'm sorry, I can't place it myself. Can you? Not at all. Okay. Yeah. Okay, well, maybe you've got another question there to that viewer, Pauline. Please feel free to write in. Uh, this next one here says from Christine. God blessings to you both tonight. My question is this. In Exodus 33, 4 to 11, verse 11, it says... Uh, Moses said, met, met God face to face in his tent. But as we continue to verse 20, when Moses asked to see God's glory, God replied, no one can see my face and live. Hope you can clarify, clarify this for me. Blessings from Christine. And the Bible is quite replete. No man has seen God face to face and lived. Uh, this is why when Moses prayed to God that he wanted to see him, that God finally relented, uh, covered Moses in the cleft of the rock in the valley, 
as God passed through, and Moses was only allowed to see, quote, his backside, unquote. But when we meet people face to face, remember that that's a, a, a casual terminology. Uh, it does not necessarily mean that we are nose to nose. Uh, what it does mean is that we're meeting. Now, for example, um, Cyrus, you and I are meeting uh, right now electronically, and I, I can see your face. Mm. But do I describe that as meeting you face to face? Very true. Mm -hmm. You know, you see, the terminology has different meanings. People tend to think of something only in the first literal context in which they talk with them. But couldn't Moses have met God face to face in prayer without actually seeing his face? After all, God is spirit. It's not like he has a physical face like you and I do. And so be careful of reading things too literally. Remember that God does use metaphor and simile, analogy, uh, allegory, proverb, uh, that there are many ways in which we, we illustrate truths. And in our phraseology, be careful not to take them too literally. This next one here is saying, good evening, Cyrus and Dr. Grady. God said to the serpent in the Garden of Eden, you have bruised me in the heel. Uh, but I shall bruise you in the head. I put the enmity between his seed and your seed. And uh, there's no name on that, but thank you for your comment. Do you have any comments on that one, Grady? Well, I do, because it's not a really very good reading. Um, the, the prophecy was that Satan would bruise the Savior, Jesus, on the heel. And that is a prophecy that was fulfilled on the cross, because in crucifixion, the heel is bruised. Um, but what it really says there is, but he, the Savior, the Son of God, Jesus Christ, will crush your head. And that's a much better understanding. Not bruise his head, crush it. And so I don't know what translation you might be using, but it's not, not a good translation at all there. Well, it's funny because another viewer has written something very, very similar as well. Paul and Ruth has written as well. Cyrus and Dr. Grady, blessings to you both. It says in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. Could that be that Hamas are a result of the brain damage Satan of our present day? Does that heel represent Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection and that I am will have the ultimate victory? Loving blessings in Jesus' name and that is from Paul and Ruth. Well, we did kind of explain what the prophecy itself was about. It's also a prophecy of the virgin birth, uh, if, you th if you think about it. You know, I'm going to put enmity between you and the seed of the woman, not the seed of the man. And Joseph was his adopted father, not his biological father. And so there's the prophecy of the virgin birth, as well as at the end, uh, Jesus Christ will conquer all and will crush Satan's head. Now, how much you want to read into that in the current conflict, I'll let you choose for yourself. This one's from Woody in West Worcestershire. Thank you, Woody. Hello, uh, and God bless everyone. Thank you for your wise and knowledgeable answers. Do all angelic beams ha beings have free will? As Luther was an angel, but labeled, so must um, have he have had free will. But I was told angels have to obey the Lord without thought, as they are made to fully obey. Hope this question makes sense from Woody. Oh, absolutely, Woody. And I'm going to put it in a different way because um, actually angels have partial free will. And I'm going to just invent that term uh, because remember that Satan was created perfect if you read Ezekiel. Uh, however, iniquity was found in him later, meaning that uh, he would disobey God, not follow God as he was supposed to, uh, but initially he was perfect. And he's an angelic being. So the fall of Satan occurs right after the week of creation when he rebels against God in heaven, having seen the six days of creation and covets God's creative power. But one third of the angels chose to follow Satan. So they do not have 100% free will. They cannot be saved. There's no plan of salvation for a fallen angel. And so while they made a decisive decision to follow Satan, as Satan decided to rebel against God, recorded in Isaiah, um, they do not have total free will. 
And I, I, I love uh, one little section of Revelation when God says it's finally time that Satan's going to be bound and thrown in the lake of fire. He sends one little angel. Uh, <laughs> I just, I, I love that particular phrase. But the fact of the matter is they, they have to obey the commands of God. But they do have partial free will, which is why one third of the angels could rebel but, of course, their judgment will be severe in the end time, and they have no hope of salvation whatsoever. This one's from Chris in Penzant. Good evening, Cy and Dr. Grady. Can I give a scripture and a comment and then a question, please? Talk about 1 Timothy uh, uh, 4, verse 10. We work hard and suffer much in order for people will believe the truth. Our, for our hope is in the living God, who is a saviour of all people and particularly of those who believe. Christ is a saviour of all, but his salvation becomes effective only for those who trust him. So why do we listen to false pre preachers and teachers behind the pulpit? The mainstream teacher, uh, churches are accepting those with immoral lifestyles to become ordained priests to preach behind the pulpit. What is more false than what we have, uh, con which we are condemned by God's word in 1 Corinthians 6 verse 9 to 10? When these will not see the kingdom of God, so there is their, their ministry is um, futile. The question is, how blind can these preachers be to know the scriptures and be ignorant of them and at the same time blindness and ignorance of the employers to take them on, etc. God bless from Chris in Penn's Ants. Interesting question. Do you have any thoughts on that one? I do. It's really quite simple. Um, of course, it ultimately comes down to sin. But when I'm talking about this particular kind of sin, it's the sin of compromise. You see, instead of believing the Bible in errancy, they start by making one compromise with the Bible. For instance, uh, being a creation scientist myself, um, once they accept evolutionary time and try to stick it in the Bible, that leads to another compromise, it leads to another compromise, it leads to another compromise. And these compromises start going downhill like a snowball, getting bigger and bigger uh, in their lives. And they turn more and more liberal. And as they turn more and more liberal, they're more and more accepting of sin and bringing that sin into the church. And so it is a, a consequence of starting with just one compromise, whatever it might be. Uh, they might compromise on the age of the earth, or they might compromise in some other way. Um, too many uh, Christian pastors, in my opinion, uh, are preaching that God is love, and we all agree that's true. Yep. God is love, and he is loving 100%. Mm -hmm. I fully agree. Yep. But when they teach that that's the only attribute of God they're going to dwell on, then they accept everybody and say, oh, we must love this one and we must love that one in spite of whatever sins there may be in their life and the fact that maybe they didn't even accept Jesus as Lord and Savior in their life. Again, that's something you have to interview. But they're forgetting that God is also omnijudicious. And if you're not familiar with that word, you're familiar with omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent. But omnijudicious is God is the king of the universe. He is also the judge of the universe, and he judges all things. And so, yes, God is love, and he is 100% loving, and we couldn't love unless he first loved. But they're forgetting that when people do wrong, God also judges, even the believer. He chastises those he loves. And so those of us that do things that are wrong will suffer from some kind of chastisement to help get us back on the right road again and to correct bad behaviors that we might have had, but people forget the, the justice of God and only want to dwell on the love of God, and that's when they go astray in a large extent. Us as Christians, Grady, how important is it for us as Christians to have fear of the Lord, that we are looking up to the Lord, but we're also fearful of him. We know he's a loving God. We understand that we're his children. He's here to look after us, but at the same time, we have that fear of the Lord. Tell our viewers about that. Well, yes, we are to have a fear of God. But again, words have different nuances. I, I just, you know, I stress that on the program all the time. And we're to have a reverential fear of God. We're not supposed to have a trembling, hide in the corner, uh, woe is me kind of fear of God. 
uh, knowing that he is so almighty, uh, that he is sovereign, and that anything he says goes. But we are to have a reverential fear of God, which is what keeps us from doing wrong things, wanting to have a relationship with him, wanting to love him because he first loved us. And a reverential fear is a very positive thing, as opposed to what most people think about the word fear, which is to cringe and hide and and um, understand how much you've done wrong. But, but again, it's what kind of fear? But it's a reverential fear. It's, it's not a trembling nervousness. Okay, this next one here, there's a, it's a viewer. There's no name on this one, but it says this. Dr. Grady, my grandson, Billy, wanted to ask a question, but it's past his bedtime. Um, and I said I'd ask it for him. He's been looking at the shoe built stalk and he says uh, when it's angry, it looks like a dinosaur. The question is, do they have a common ancestor? God bless. So that's from the grandson, Billy. What do you think? Well, no, they don't have a common ancestor, because if they did, that would be an evolutionary concept, which would be non-biblical. God created dinosaurs as dinosaurs and people as people and birds, regardless of what they are, as fully formed to begin with. This is one of the things that just tears evolutionists up, that when we look in the fossil record, everything we find is fully formed, functional, and we never find anything in between. And so the only reason they promote the idea that dinosaurs and birds are related is because they both have hollow bones, and then they try to make up fairy tales for adults that one evolved into the other so that the dinosaurs never really became extinct. They just evolved into the birds, and that the birds are the dinosaurs around us today. But it's not true. It's absolutely not true. It's not true scientifically. It's not true biblically. And so please tell Billy for me that no... God created one and the other as what they are, and they did not come one from another. There you go, Billy. I hope that's answered your question, mate. Uh, this next one's from Duncus, Duncan in Inverness. Hi, Cy and Dr. Grady. On Saturday, Revelation TV and Dr. Grady demonstrated God's existence by ways of significant numbers between major Israeli events, 40 and 1,000 years, for example. Where could I find a summary of these numbers and dates given? Thanks for an excellent program then and now. Blessings from Duncan in Inverness. You can find the program on our website, revelationtv.com. Just go onto the video on demand section. You'll be able to find that on, a, on our VOD. But Gray, did you have any for, further thoughts on that particular program? Well, I, I, since I'm not exactly sure which program you saw, um, since I know that sometimes you play them and not necessarily. He says, in, he in says a, you yeah, demonstrated order. God's existence by way of yes. significant numbers uh, between right. major Israeli events, 40 and 1,000 years. Yes, and I think what he's talking about there uh, has to do specifically with uh, material that's found in my book on the Feast of the Old Testament. I also have a chapter in my creation book. But numbers have real significance, and I think in that particular program, I was pointing out that the day on the Jewish calendar that the ark came to rest is the same day they walked through the Red Sea, that they ate of the first fruits of the Promised Land, and Christ rose from the dead. And that's over a 2,500-year period of time. And I think possibly in that show, I also had talked about the Ninth of Av, a minor feast in the summertime. But the, the many things that occurred on that exact same date spread over 4,000 years. Um, this is when the 10 spies came back with a bad report. This is when the first and second temples were both destroyed. It's, it's a, a date that's the worst date in Jewish history. So I think maybe it's that program. But you will find all that in my book on the Feast of the Old Testament. And feel free to find the archive program on Revelation. Also, and if you go onto our website as well, revelationtv.com, you'll be able to download the R Times. You can see the, uh, the time that program was on. You'll be seeing the name of the program, and then you'll be able to find it even easier on our website. So I do hope you're able to find that for yourself. Uh, John in Belfast has written in Dr. Grady. It says, good evening, Cyrus and Dr. Grady. My question is this. Is 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 12, Paul says... 
I allow no woman to teach or have authority over men. She is to refrain in quietness and keep silent in religious assemblies. My interpretation of this piece of the scripture would lead me to believe that women shouldn't preach the word of God from the pulpit. I find this very difficult to accept. Can you please tell me your opinion on this, Dr. Grady? And that's John in Belfast. Well, women do have a place in, in teaching the children. They have a, yeah. a place in teaching each other. But if you'll go to Ephesians and you take a look at the order in which uh, God has placed a hierarchy, um, Paul is admonishing that women should not instruct men directly. Uh, but they do have a role, and they do have a role in instruction, uh, instructing other women, uh, instructing children. Uh, however, I would struggle with the idea of, of women being senior pastors or however the term you use, uh, depending upon denominations. Uh, it, but it's simply a hierarchy that uh, we're to follow as Christ is the head of the church and the husband is the head of the wife, that there's a hierarchy. But it's not a hierarchy of tyranny. It's simply a hierarchy of authority in the sense that we are to be mutually uh, respectful of each other, that we are of equal value, um, that husbands are to love their wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. So husbands are to love their wives sacrificially. So it's not a question of, of value. It is a question of simple organization. I just think of uh, pr um, pastors like Joyce Meyer, for example. She reached, I think she reaches both demographics as well, and she does a wonderful job at it as well. Some powerful messages there, Dr. Grady. Um, yes, Susan, I agree. Susan's written in. Good evening to you both. I was wondering about Daniel 2.34. Who or what is the rock described here that smashes the feet of iron and clay? Well, I would suggest to you it's Jesus Christ in a metaphorical sense. That, that Jesus is the one who destroys these various false religions and false cultures of the past. Thank you, Grady. This next one here is from Jonathan and Peter. Uh, good evening, gentlemen. Question for Dr. Grady. Uh, what were the different seasons like in the world prior to the flood? Genesis 1.14 says the sun and the moon were created for times and seasons. So we assume there were, were seasons from creation onwards. But we, are, we have heard that the climate was constant all year round prior to the flood. Keep up the good work, Jonathan and Peter. Well, Peter, there's two Peter. things. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, there's two things there. First of all, in the sense of seasons like summer, winter, fall, spring, there was no such thing before the flood. If you take a look at Genesis 8.22, it talks about after the flood, then those seasons are initiated, uh, primarily because of the 40 days and 40 nights of rain at the beginning of the flood. Um, the extra moisture in the atmosphere that was there before the flood and referenced in uh, day two when God created the waters above and the waters below. There were already waters on the surface of the earth uh, on day one, verse two. Uh, but God does add some moisture to the atmosphere uh, on day two. And that's the water that came down primarily, although there was other sources as well. Uh, but remember that the word seasons, again, has different nuances. So you're limiting your idea to the four natural seasons. In fact, uh, if you think about it, though, uh, there are seasons of the year, such as... Um, in the feasts, you know, the the beginning feasts are in the spring, around the end of March, beginning of April. And then in the fall, we have the high holy days, for instance. Um, so those are seasons within the year, but they have nothing to do with the fact that it's necessarily summer, winter, and so on. And don't we in our lives sometimes talk about, you know, there's seasons in our life. Now, um, I'm going to be having another birthday pretty soon, and I'm looking at that as another season in my life. Um, and, and so we have those different seasons of, well, yes, I was a child, and then I was a juvenile, and then I was a, an adult, and now I'm a seasoned citizen. 
<laughs> and those are those are different seasons in my life. And so the word seasons has different uses, and we need to rightly discern that before the flood, there the the natural seasons that we think of didn't exist because the earth was pretty uniformly warm, and and there was no snow, there was no ice, uh, anything of that nature. But that occurs after the flood. Um, so the natural seasons begin in Genesis eight twenty two. This one's from Bob uh, asking about female disciples. Was there fe were, were there female disciples during Jesus' time on earth? Well, not in the sense of the, the apostles. But we do know, and again, I want to go back to a previous answer as well. P women do have leadership roles within the church in, in the proper sense, and they can even be deaconesses. Uh, that is absolutely mentioned in the New Testament, without a doubt. Uh, and uh, at some point, they needed a seamstress, and they raised uh, one from the dead. <laughs> so I think that women certainly have important roles in the church. And okay. that uh, we can look at these examples to see that. Very good. We've got five minutes to go, Grady. Still a few emails to go. Corey's written in saying, Dear Cyrus and Grady, greetings from Ireland. We always enjoy listening to Dr. Grady. He has so much wisdom and he does not compromise the truth. The question is from Isaiah 30 to 20, uh, 30, 25. The moon will shine like the sun and the sunlight will be seven times brighter. What effect will that be for the earth? May God bless you. And that is from Corey. Well, in a natural sense, that's going to, of course, heat the earth. Um, right now, we live in, a, in the habitable zone uh, from the sun. But if we take those as literal natural numbers, that's, it's going to be seven times brighter, then the earth would be considerably scorched. And while I do not at all specialize in the end times, uh, we're told that, of course, the oceans are going to be evaporated significantly in the end time. There's also another way of looking at it, though. Uh, remember that the number seven uh, has a biblical terminology, you know, what we look at in theomatics, and that it could be a, a simply a, a biblical metaphor, a biblical uh, typology uh, of God's light shining on this sinful earth at the end times when he's going to eventually then restore it. This next one here is, says, Hi to you both, Richard in Lulworth here. Is it, uh, is it relevant that the famous sycamore fell in Isaiah 9.10 over the Emperor Hadrian's wall from the Roman side onto the wilderness side? Great to hear Dr. Grady's thoughts on this. Uh, since Hadrian's wall is not mentioned in the Bible, I have a, a problem with that. Um... Si, can you fill me in on what you think he's talking about? Let me see if I can read this again. See if, is it relevant that the famous sycamore fell in Isaiah 9.10? So Isaiah 9.10. That's the okay. reference. So we're talking about Isaiah. So that's 700 years before Christ. Yep. Over what the does that emperor, have to do with Hadrian's? From the Roman side onto the wilderness side. Maybe for that viewer who's uh, just written in, if you can quickly write in in the next couple of minutes and try and clarify that, we'll try and see if we can ask Grady before we finish the program. Uh, let's go to the next one, Dr. Grady. This one is from Bridget. Um, this one's saying Isaiah 2, 19, verse concepts. Men will go into caves and to the rocks and over the hill, holes of the ground before the terror of the Lord and the splendor of his majesty when he arises to make the earth tremble. Perhaps this is a scripture Pauline was referring to. Okay, thank you very much indeed for that, Bridget. Uh, let's go into this next one here. Uh, let's see, what do we have? This one. Oh, let's say it's only coming twice. Um, Dr. Grady, it says, Dr. Grady, could you please talk about when will the likes of the Nephilim and demons get destroyed? Great, as, great program as usual. That's from John. Well, the Nephilim are 100% human, referenced in Genesis chapter 6. Uh, they all perished in the flood, or though some may have died before the flood, but they all perished, uh, if they were alive, in the flood. And so they've been long gone. Um, demonic spirits, of course, we dealt with later. 
because they don't have lifespans like we do. Uh, but the Nephilim are long gone and dealt with the time of the flood. Okay, this next one's saying, I know some Christians who believe that an illness should and could be avoided if one's faith is strong enough. This leaves me feeling condemned as I have some ailments. In spite of prayer and more prayer, these conditions remain. I'd appreciate Grady's thoughts on this, please. Any thoughts on that? You're a normal human being, just like me. And the older we get, the more aches and pains we get. <laughs> but, but it is our attitude and our motivation as to how we live the, our lives with those inconveniences. You know, uh, I'm having physical problems, but the attitude has got to be, what's that compared to eternity? And your ultimate healing will occur when you go to heaven. Um, Paul had his thorn in the flesh. Uh, why shouldn't we? What makes us special? Uh, why should we say, well, why me? And then say to yourself, why not me? And realize that in dealing with it in your life, you can be a witness for Jesus just as well as if you didn't have it. Amen. I want to say a big thank you to Dr. Grady McMurch. Your wonderful, inspirational words there at the end of this night's program. Grady, your website is going to be on screen, creationworldview.org. So much pieces of information. In 20 seconds, tell our viewers what's on your website. Well, we have over 100 articles if you like to read. We have over 400 videos right now that are short that you can spend time just going through, getting tidbits of information. We have a full bookstore as well, including Amen. electric downloads. We appreciate you coming. Thank you so much, Dr. Grady. So much information shared on tonight's program. Go on to our website, revelationtv.com slash videos. Thank you so much to Dr. Grady McMurtry on tonight's program. And we're praying for our Israel. Our thoughts and our prayers are with those innocent lives. In Jesus' mighty name, pray and protect Israel at a time like this. Amen. Bye-bye.